Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and boy this is your last chance next week is conference. It's like in the next few days you're registering or you're not coming. And um, we're so excited about this conference for two reasons. The roster of speakers is very interesting and we bring speakers together who don't normally appear on the same uh, roster of speakers. In other words, Tom Seyfried, uh, the researcher who wrote Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, he's never spoken on the same um, uh, speaker list as Colin Campbell. And Colin Campbell and Peter Bregan live in Ithaca, both of them, and they've never even met each other, let alone spoken at the same conference. And so the contrast of these people talking about various topics, the common denominator between them being that they're such good researchers and they have contributed so much to science and to helping uh, people with health issues that uh, that's the common denominator but th this group of people is just amazing. One other thing I'll point out is that uh, we try to cover even nutrition related topics from a different point of view. I don't remember ever going to a conference where the topic was nutrition and gastric reflux, um, gastroesophageal reflux or nutrition and pregnancy, two of the topics that we're covering. So get yourself here. And then the other thing is their 20th anniversary. And I don't know what you guys think about this, but I think it's a big deal. I think it's tough to stay in business and to get something successful and build it. And we've done that. We're pretty proud of ourselves. And yes, there will be cake. You don't want to miss that either. It's vegan cake, but we're having cake. So get your ticket, come to Columbus, the food's fabulous, the people are fabulous, the talks will change your life and you will be very sorry if you're watching all this stuff on Facebook and saying, gosh, I wish I was there. The other thing I'll mention just really quickly is last week I filmed a brand new updated informed decision-making video. It's posted on our website at wellnessfarmhealth.com and if you haven't watched this, it really talks a lot about our perspective on health and what we do. So it's free and it's very educational, I promise you learn something new and even if you watch the old one the new one is far better that's the thing new and improved okay a couple topics for today according to a new study eating a high protein diet does result in weight loss but it does not improve insulin sensitivity Bettina Mittendorfer and her colleagues followed 34 obese sedentary postmenopausal women for seven months all of the women were obese they had a BMI of 30 or greater but none of them had diabetes at the time the study began. And there were three intervention programs. They were randomly assigned to one of them. One was just regular ma weight maintenance diet, just do what you're doing now, essentially. Another one was reduced calorie diet with 0 0.8 grams of protein per um, kilogram per day. And that was the weight loss diet. And then reduced calorie diet with 1.2 gr uh, grams of protein um, per kilogram per day. And that was the weight loss high protein diet. So the amount of protein varied, but the carbohydrate and fat intake was the same. The end of seven months, both, both of the waste, weight loss groups had lost an average of 10% of their body weight. That's not bad. The women eating a higher protein diet were able to preserve one additional pound of lean muscle mass. That's good, but not really anything to write home about. Um, in fact, Mittendorfer stated, quote, we question whether there's a significant clinical benefit to such a small difference. The high protein eaters had no advantage over the normal protein eaters in terms of intrahepatic triglycerides, um, intra-abdominal fat, adipose tissue, and basal insulin levels. But the women in the weight loss group who were not eating high protein had a 25 to 30% improvement in insulin sensitivity. The women eating the extra protein, not at all. The researchers concluded that while it's commonly thought that eating a higher protein diet is important for preserving muscle mass and reducing the risk of conditions like sarcopenia, many of the expected outcomes that the researchers thought would happen as a result of eating more protein just didn't happen. They further concluded that eating a high protein diet causes alterations in muscle structure and oxidative stress, which interferes with the therapeutic effect weight loss should have on insulin sensitivity. So I want to be real crystal still clear here what this is saying is that the women who are eating a lower protein diet were much better off than the women who were eating a higher protein diet in terms of insulin sensitivity. And commenting about the study, Mittendorfer said, changing the protein content has very big effects. It's not that the metabolic benefits of weight loss were diminished. They were completely abolished in women who consumed high protein diets, even though they lost the same substantial amounts of weight as women who ate the diet that was lower in protein. 
Now another researcher chimed in about this, Adam Rose from the German Cancer Research Center said this study adds to a growing body of evidence showing that higher protein intake leads to worsening metabolic health even when the calorie restriction that accompanies it leads to weight loss. In other words, both researchers are saying high protein diets will result in weight loss, they just don't improve health. In fact, people can become sicker while they eat them. Limitations of the study included small sample size and the fact that all participants were women, so we don't know if the effect would be the same theoretically in men or if, the, um, if people who, who already had diabetes were included in the study, but in spite of these limitations, the results are pretty clear. Health-promoting diets are lower, not higher, in protein. Just the opposite of what we're told all the time. And by the way, there are quite a few studies in our Informed Health 101 book um, that talk about protein. This is certainly not an isolated study. It's just a new one. And the reason I point these things out from time to time is um, there's this dripping of information in the medical journals about the right ideas about health. And I'm hoping that if I drip on you with those right ideas about health, uh, you'll you'll um, come around to our way of thinking about some things based on the evidence. All right, so another thing we hear all the time is about um, the, the benefits of fish and fish oil, and you're better off eating fish than beef and pork or even fish instead of chicken. Fish, we're told, is a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, and people who eat fish or take omega-3 supplements have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease and CBD-related death. The only problem with all this is it just isn't true. In a recent prospective cohort study of over 39,000 women who were enrolled in the Women's Health Study, researchers looked at the relationship between fish and omega-3 intake and the risk of major cardiovascular disease, myo and cardio infarction, infarction, stroke, and CVD-related death. Eating more fish didn't help. It didn't matter how much fish you ate. More fish, less fish, no difference at all in the outcomes. And in the conclusion, the authors wrote, in this cohort of women without history of cardiovascular disease, intakes of tuna and dark fish, um, omega-3 fatty acids, not associated with the risk of major cardiovascular disease. Now, if this were the only study that said this, then we wouldn't be quite so quick to say fish is not actually a health food. But there are plenty of studies that have shown this. Another women's study, for example, showed no association between eating fish or fish oil with mortality from cardiovascular disease or stroke in postmenopausal women. And a meta-analysis showed that eating fish didn't reduce the risk of stroke. Even more concerning, there is a growing body of evidence showing that fish can increase the risk of death. A study involving over 3,100 men with chest pain showed that eating two servings a week of oily fish or taking three fish oil capsules daily did not improve health. In fact, men who ate oily fish had a higher risk of death from cardiovascular disease and the risk was slightly higher for those taking fish oil pills, even worse than eating the fish. In another study, taking fish oil did lower triglycerides by 30%. The problem was that taking the pills also increased plasma cholesterol levels and increased narrowing of the arteries. The researchers concluded, quote, fish oil treatment for two years does not promote favorable changes in the diameter of atherosclerotic coronary arteries, end of quote. The bottom line is that fish does not deserve special treatment. It's just another flesh food. And the best thing to do is sharply reduce or eliminate. And sometimes people are real shocked to find out that um, that fish doesn't get special dispensation. When we talk about uh, animal food and the diet being really, really restricted down to two to three servings, no dairy, and uh, they're thinking, well, certainly you don't mean fish. And actually, we do mean fish, and it is no better. In fact, many fish have pretty high saturated fat content, which I don't think most people know. So uh, bottom line is leave fish in the water most of the time. That's probably the best advice I can give you. All right, that's all for today. As always, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.